In the north woods are thousands of little ponds, slowly being choked by a creeping mat of tangled roots and moss. The bog jungle, a colorful place and the origin of many tall tales. Have you ever seen a bog? Let's join these summer camp explorers and discover some of the most amazing things of the plant world. Rare orchids, a special kind of moss that holds many times its own weight of water, and strange plant traps that catch live insects. This might be called the bog trot. It shows how the whole surface is a quaking but secure mat of interlacing roots and moss extended over water. By jumping up and down, you can make small trees 20 feet away wave back and forth. If you're a gardener, you know about peat moss, found by the ton in our bogs. It's the best stuff you can get for packing plants, and it will keep them moist and fresh for many days. On a hot summer's day, tear a small hole in the matted peat moss. Thrust in your hand or a thermometer and see how cool it is only a few inches below the surface. This is why Canadian trees like the tamarack and black spruce can live many miles to the south when rooted in the cool moss of a bog. This is black spruce used for Christmas trees. These beautiful magenta orchids have a queer device for getting pollinated. But the most fantastic plants of the bog jungle are those whose leaves take the form of a trap which catches live insects. This is the pitcher plant, and you are about to view spectacular close-ups of how it operates, followed by remarkable scenes of the sundew and Venus flytrap from the camera of Dr. William M. Harlow. The story begins in Alaska, where melting glaciers are all that remain of a great sheet of ice which once covered Canada and parts of the northern United States. During the last ice age, more snow fell each winter than melted the following summer, and so there developed the continental ice sheet, a mile or more in depth, which slowly ground its way southward, scooping out uncounted thousands of depressions that filled with water as the ice finally began to melt and retreat between 15 and 20,000 years ago. In our northern states, myriads of these little ponds and, and around the smaller ones, especially those poorly drained, is found a fascinating plant society, the bog jungle. A mossy mat creeps out from the edges of the pond, and in this mat grows the tangled jungle of shrubs and ferns which partly hide the strangest plants known to man, plants which capture live insects. The largest are these pitcher plants, with their erect tube-shaped leaves that catch and hold rainwater. Attracted by a perfume released from the plant, flies and other insects come to visit and sometimes are drowned in the reservoir of water below. Along the red edges of the pitchers are the perfume glands and the upper part of the leaf provides a seemingly attractive landing place for its visitors. But now the trap reveals its cunning device for directing insects to their doom. A field of stiff white hairs, all pointing downward. An insect that loses its grip is lost. While we leave this ladybird beetle trying to navigate through the field of bristles, Let's explore the final secret of the pitcher plant's curious trap. What? Still there? This leaf has been split lengthwise, and we can see that the center portion has sides as smooth as glass. It seems impossible for an insect to crawl out of the water and up those polished walls. In the dark portion at the bottom, it is presumed the plant absorbs useful materials from the insects it catches. There he goes, and the trap has claimed another victim. And so we leave the passive traps of the pitcher plant to explore further the bog jungle and to discover the sundew, a plant so-called because its tiny leaves bear hundreds of sensitive tentacles,
capped by droplets of clear mucilage that shine in the sunlight like dew. The movement of the leaves and their tentacles has been recorded by time-lapse photography so that growth is here speeded up about 7,000 times. Charles Darwin, famed for his theory of evolution, lived before the invention of motion pictures. But he, like many others, was fascinated by these little plants and how they so efficiently capture and digest insects. Here, tremendously enlarged, is a young opening leaf of the sundew. While the camera was recording two days' growth, here seen in a few seconds, it did not appear that much was happening. But if you look closely, you can see tiny specks moving around. These are extremely small insects being caught by flying against the mucilage-producing glands at the tips of the tentacles. Let's view a single leaf at close range and see how it operates. In about 20 minutes, this hapless midget of a fly, caught on one of the outer tentacles, is brought into the center of the leaf, and its digestion begun by the acid mucilage poured out by the glistening glands. After the insect is brought to the center of the leaf, the action becomes slower. Eighteen hours are here compressed into 40 seconds on the screen. Darwin found that when he stroked the tentacles, they reacted, but soon returned to about the same position. This caused him to wonder how slight a pressure on the glands would cause the tentacles to move. Notice the tiny fragments of white cotton thread placed on the outer glands, and how the tentacles bend and then recover. Darwin also found that most protein substances caused intense action, but that many other things, such as this thin slice of carrot, were not attacked. In the center of the leaf is a tiny cube of hard-boiled egg white being digested. This is one of several proteins used by Darwin in his experiments. What you are seeing is perhaps something like watching the workings of a stomach turned inside out. Certainly, there is no doubt that each leaf is a live, pulsating, beautifully sensitive creation. And now a raw hamburger. To feed one of these tiny leaves a piece of raw meat half the size of a grain of rice is like giving a 20-pound chunk of beef to a very small dog. While the time-lapse camera recorded this scene, something quite unexpected happened. At the lower left, a tiny fly joins the meat. And notice how the edges of the meat turn gray as it is digested. Although the leaves of sundew are stimulated to action by particles of egg white, cheese, meat, and in general other proteins, they show their greatest activity in the capture of live prey. A tiny aphid caught in one of the outer tentacles is carried to the center and soon smothered in the digestive fluid produced by the glands. The entire action of this scene covers about 18 hours. The insect catchers of the bog jungle have green leaves and so they manufacture their own carbohydrate food materials like other green plants. What then is the importance of the elaborate mechanisms for trapping insects? Although this is too big a question to answer in a few seconds, it should be remembered that these plants grow in boggy places where available nitrogen and minerals are scarce or lacking. Presumably the plants get such substances from the insects they catch. Darwin and others found that plants fed with insects were more vigorous and reproduced better than those deprived of insect prey. In boggy spots in eastern North Carolina is found the Venus flytrap, perhaps the most remarkable of all insect catchers. Each leaf is folded in the center, and the edges bear long teeth, so that in time-lapse one gets the impression 
of a steel trap slowly opening. Attracted by perfume glands along the edge of the leaf, this earwig is carrying on a dangerous exploration. Caught in the trap, it is digested by fluids produced from hundreds of tiny glands that carpet the inside surface of the leaf. A healthy trap may snap shut in less than a half second. Now let's explore the inside of one of these traps and see the trigger hairs. There are usually six of them, three on each side. Notice that one stimulus does not cause the trap to close. It is necessary to touch the same hair twice to get action. or the trap closes when two hairs are touched, one and then the other. This truly remarkable mechanism in the Venus flytrap has puzzled many investigators. All views of the closing traps were taken at normal camera speed. This is Timorous Tilly. She smells the bait, but suspicious by nature, she fears that something is about to happen and it's not good. Fortunately for Tilly, she fell off before she fell in. But she never seems to learn. Watch her scoot through this one and out the other end. Occasionally, a leaf is defective and the trap closes only part way. This seems to confuse the Japanese beetle. Now he comes lumbering into another trap, but this one is in working order. Earwigs and other medium-sized insects cannot get out of the Venus flytrap, which only squeezes them tighter as they struggle to escape. But the Japanese beetle is a hardy fellow, quite strong and a good fighter. For the flytrap, it's like fishing. The biggest ones get away. And so closes a chapter of nature in which the usual eaters, the insects, are the eaters.